must be coming uh, must be coming from somewhere else so it was not from his uh, uh, you know uh, uh, christological nature uh, uh, divine nature uh, uh, it was coming from well uh, human nature um, he had to earn it Without going into much detail, the scripture says that Jesus was earning his authority since his childhood. And in Luke 2, 52, it is said that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So here we see that he was kind of climbing certain ladder. According to this, he was earning this place even before, uh, even before the father. It wasn't magical. It wasn't coming from the logos. It wasn't celestially inherited. It was earned. And uh, in Philippians, where the two, where, where this uh, theory of kenosis comes from, uh, it is said exactly that he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the of the cross. And now he earns back the reputation. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And uh, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. So uh, Jesus earned... Uh, his exaltation and his authority. It wasn't something that was inherited. So for Jesus, there was no uh, escape from the truth and its consequences, while, while for the scribes, there was. Um, I remember uh, how disappointed I was when I was talking with one famous professor uh, who tried to justify the signature he has put on the delim delimitation of academic freedom document during the, the endorsement process. He said basically that he was against the document, he didn't agree with it, but he signed it because he thought it was only a temporary thing, um, something that the, this current administration you know, plays with, and he hoped that he will weather it out. And ulti ultimately, uh, he wanted the seat at the table when, where he can make changes in the long run. I completely understood uh, the human side, you know, the, 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 uh, the human reasons uh, for his actions. But this is precisely how one loses the authority, by escaping the consequences of truth, um, especially when those consequences are costly. Uh, so as a result, I never, I, I, I do not remember at all uh, his brilliant theological expose that he gave at that meeting, but I do remember this conversation when, where, when his brilliance and expertise was basically overshadowed by this act, but this, by this short conversation, and it lost all its weight. Um, now, the same happened <clears throat> uh, here in Serbia uh, with the authority of uh, our union conference office. Um, as you know, uh, we, we are dealing here with uh, uh, a serious case of uh, domestic abuse that happened in a, in a pastoral home. And uh, the, the whole thing was complicated. Uh, it was complex, but... Um, what happened actually is um, that some of the uh, uh, some of the people in administration were caught uh, 
manipulating the facts, presenting different pictures of the same event to different people, different groups of people within the church in order to, uh, I don't know, uh, balance or whatever. Um, and uh, instead of making the se themselves accountable to face the music, you know, no, they were trying to manipulate the whole thing. And um, to make matters worse, they started witch hunt uh, to flush uh, the whistleblower who actually caught them and proved that uh, they were doing precisely that. And then um, after all this, uh, the same administration um, made the whole pastoral body uh, listen to lectures with discussions and workshops on the topic of integrity. <laughs> and this is what it means to keep a Judas kiss for the consequences of the truth. Uh, so I listened the lecture. This is, this is crazy. I listened to the lecture, the lecture in which every single word is true and right as rain. But that did not matter because it, the truth has been used. These high values were used in order to dupe, to dupe people. And this whole thing, you know, it's not just professors, it's not just, uh, you know, administration. It can happen to church members as well uh, and pastors. Um, we had a project called Relay in Novi Sad, which uh, was attracting students and young people uh, in their 20s. And uh, people worked and everything was fine. And they, you know, did Bible studies. And when there was a decision time, um, these young people, uh, you know, went uh, to be baptized in some other Protestant churches. Uh, and when the managing team, the pastors and, and uh, lay people who worked with them, came to them and asked them what happened, why they went over there when we have the truth. And the reply was, you have the truth, but they have love. And that was it. The true information does not necessarily grant the authority, the authority to speak, at least not in the matters of faith, not in the matters of the, king, the kingdom of God. If the facts cost us nothing, there is no authority in the mere knowledge of the facts. The speaker does not derive his or her authority from the knowledge. The authority comes from within the speaker, not from the speech. We have in Hebrews uh, 4, 12 and 13, it is said, uh, the word of God is basically explained what, what that is. And, and uh, it said that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from it, from its sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, according to this text, the nature of word of God is that it cleaves through a person and it strips people naked, which means that it breaks through the toughest facade, goes to the deepest secrets of soul, and uncovers the truth about person or, or people or group of people. Now, the metaphor that is used here to, to actually uh, describe the word of God is double-edged sword. Now, what it comes from the text is that this metaphor and the meaning of the metaphor is, uh, uh, you know, double-edged sword and it's sharp, all right? The original meaning is that this metaphor brings sharpness, but uh, I will be uh, creative and use proverbial meaning as well, include proverbial meaning as well, which means that a uh, double-edged sword is some kind of tool that have both favorable, favorable and unfavorable favorable consequences. This means that those who want to wield the sword of the word of God with authority, 
whether that uh, you know word of God comes from the Bible or from the vision or wherever, you know, this sword has first to cut the one who wields it because it's double-edged. It first has to make its mark on, on the speaker. It first has to cost him or her. It has to rip his or her life apart first and then to rip apart uh, the life of the, the listeners. But how does the word of God rip apart the lives of Seventh-day Adventists? That, that's, where's the proof that this uh, revealing and, uh, you know, um, cleaving through a facade and stripping people naked uh, actually happens? Teaching something that asks a lot from the listeners and a little or nothing from the speaker or the, the teaching authority equals teaching without authority. For example, Adventist clergy have to be very careful when they preach about Sabbath. Of course, with this, you know, authority, because Adventist clergy is one small group of people in Adventism uh, that is excused from any guilt for working on Sabbath. So we do not, it does not cost us to preach strongly <laughs> about Sabbath because it doesn't, it doesn't apply on us. I mean, we can, we can do that, but people will see through that and we will lose authority. We will preach without authority. We will preach mere knowledge and that's it. Another example would be tithing. Clergy should be very careful when preaching on this topic. Why? Because not only that we, it's, you know, not a huge personal cost for us, but there is a lot to gain <laughs> from, you know, again, Adventist clergy is that small group of people who will gain a lot from this truth. So we have to be very careful how we preach about tithing has to be much more sincere. The word cannot be used to exert dominance and achieve goals. The word has to be used, used for cutting and stripping. And that cutting and stripping has to go both ways. Otherwise, if it, if it is not egalitarian, uh, the word will not bear authority. Now we turn to Jesus. Jesus' preaching cost him everything. He said, when you give, give in secret. And the cost was lack of wealthy donors. Because wealthy donors, they don't want to give in secret. Even in his time. He said, do not judge. And cost was that he was uh, being shamed by, uh, through association with criminally uh, or insanely ma marginalized. So he carried that shame. He also taught, love your enemies. And the cost was the <laughs> death on the cross. So that is how it looks like not to have an emergency hiding place, an emergency exit for oneself, a kiss of betrayal for the consequences of the spoken truth. Um, and it is not by accident that Jesus became popular, hugely popular, only after he actually sealed his words with, with his death. Because uh, the way he preached, it was about sacrificial love. And without that in place in his life, his word would be just, you know, imagine, just, just ask yourself, would you follow Jesus if he, at the time of, of his trial, started to beg Pilate, you know, to let him go? At that point, we would know, yeah, he, you're, you're the same as everybody else. It was all um, just uh, um, like everything else, um, a good story. 
uh, in the same passage uh, that I, uh, from Kierkegaard uh, that I was um, quoting, um, just a couple of sentences before, he says, the truth is for the particular individual only as he himself produces it in action. If the truth is for the individual in any other way, we have a phenomenon of the, of the demonic, uh, which means that truth can be used by demons, by the, the dark side, <laughs> to, to use the, the Star Wars <laughs> phrase. Uh, it can be wielded, the truth can be wielded by, by the enemy and used by the enemy. So not lies, uh, but truth. Um, so if the truth is not somehow coming from personal experience, if the truth cannot be produced in personal experience, there is no authority to it. Actually, it, it can be quite dangerous. If we apply this principle to Adventist self-understanding, we get interesting conclusions. Adventist identity and doctrine is based on the personal experience of the early Adventists with this non-event of the second coming. Uh, and we call this the great disappointment, disappointment of 1844. Nothing happened, but nevertheless, there was a certain personal experience, a walk with God closely prior to this October 22nd. All our self-understanding and all our doctrines, all our theology was formed around this non-event, around this experience of the great disappointment and the aftermath of this experience. So all Adventist theology is about uh, was formed, especially Adventist, okay, it was formed um, around this, uh, this non-event. Uh, now, today, there is no one who was even close to experiencing the great disappointment. Everybody was, is, is, you know, passed away or even talked to somebody who actually did go through this experience. However, the doctrines that were formed around this experience remain the same. As a result, contemporary Adventists are having trouble when they try to when uh, when when they try to find their identity in this Adventist doctrines, because those doctrines were formed to describe somebody else's experience, but not the experience of contemporary Adventists. And they're having trouble finding themselves in that. When it comes to the issue of speaking our doctrines with authority, uh, speaking our doctrines, at least that part that uh, connects with the, uh, the, the great disappointment, um, that's virtually impossible uh, since all of those doctrines were based on somebody else's experience and not ours. Pertaining to personal conviction, to use Lessingian uh, term, there is an ugly ditch, okay, between the early Adventists and contemporary Adventists. You could wake an early Adventist in the middle of the night and he could recite you uh, the interpretation of 2,300 uh, days and nights, uh, and understandably so. It was their lifeline against the ridicule in the aftermath of the very public assassination of their identity and hopes. The contemporary Adventists have trouble remembering how to interpret 2,300 <laughs> Uh, you wake up uh, contemporary Adventists in the middle of the night, ask them this question, I think uh, <laughs> something negative can happen to you. Uh, they will not recite you this. Because today's uh, Adventist theology does not rescue Adventists of today. Uh, does not rescue uh, Adventists from ridicule, from... Uh, from uh, uh, it does not give hope after the assassination of their of their uh, religious uh, identity. The early Adventists and the contemporary Adventists are two completely different groups of people sharing very little in terms of experience. Now, Fritz Guy 
wrote about tiers of religious activities. The first and the most fundamental tier is faith is itself. And uh, that's something that I would call the extraordinary experience around which the community is created and later on theology. Uh, second tier is theology. That's how, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, the, the community, community forms theology. And theology, the second tier, uh, religious activity, it seeks to understand this extraordinary, extraordinary experience and its impact on, on this particular community of faith. And this, and theology is always experience-based. Theology is always focused on something that happened, happened to us, and now we are trying to understand this. Now, there is a third tier religious activity, and it's called, Fritz Guy is calling it meta-theology. Meta-theology seeks to understand the theology of the group. Meta-theology does not deal with experience anymore, but it deals with text. The text that was left uh, after uh, behind this group that actually experienced something and wrote it down. Now, according to William James, the religious experience cannot be transferred to others. I cannot transfer what I have, what I have uh, experienced, but what I can transfer is the text. What I can transfer is my understanding of what happened to me. And that's what we call theology. Uh, I can transfer the theology. But if our theology is based in the experience of the disappointment of 1844, that means that without the actual experience of the disappointment, this theology comes as text. It doesn't come as experience, but it comes as, as text. Uh, it's divorced for experience because the experience cannot be transferred. As soon as that happens, we are not doing with theology, we are doing with meta theology, which is text-based. And by default, that type of theology is highly abstract, lifeless, and boring. It doesn't connect with real life because it connects with something that happened and it cannot be repeated. It is true. All the Theological concepts Adventist pioneers use to explain their experience are useful and they can be replicated, but from a completely different angle, the one that has nothing to do with the great disappointment. It has to do with the dynamics of Adventist life in 21st century. And it's completely different angle. Contemporary our Adventists are not devastated, publicly ashamed lay people whose faith left them broke and left them without their church memberships. They're not people who are now seeking for the meaning of their bittersweet experience. Contemporary Adventists are a well-established community, fairly well-respected by the public, who even had a candidate in the US presidential election race, whose theology is developed by the experts now, whose faith brought them upper mobility, they're not broke, and who are now seeking not to understand their bittersweet experience, but they're seeking for the way to maintain their gigantic operation. It's completely different group. Those two are completely different experiences, and they should be matched by completely different understanding, theological understandings. The ugly ditch between early and contemporary Adventists are, is not theological, it's sociological. That's the first thing. We are linked by the same theology, by the same text, but we are not linked by the same experience from which that text has emerged. However, what we have in practice is that minds of uh, contemporary Adventists basically crammed with a text that has nothing to do with their ex existential questions. It doesn't answer those questions. Therefore, if Kierkegaard is right about the truth being a positive thing only if it can be produced in the life of its proclaimer, then we are in real trouble. How can I produce the centrality of the, for example, sanctuary truth, which is truth, I accept it, 
but to produce the centrality of this truth in my life without actual experience of the disappointment. How can I do that? I cannot do that. And then no wonder we have the identity crisis for, for, for decades now. And no wonder that people are seeking the solution for this. And, and we have people all, all over the place trying to artificially recreate the circumstances around the great disappointment. And what, how do they do that? By predicting the date of second coming yet again. Why? Because in that experience, this theology works. It matches that kind of experience. And that's why we have recurring, recurring uh, date setting. These individuals are, not, are unconsciously trying to bridge this ugly ditch between the early and contemporary identities so that our doctrine would be able to connect to something actually real in life and that's and and therefore bear some authority and that's like yeah the imminence of second coming and date setting and etc therefore when gc president tells us to hold fast what we have i wonder what that is what do we have since the theology that we have consists of answer to someone else's existential, existential questions when we insist on basing our identity on a text rather than on a personal experience, that is how the false authorities and the scribes are made. People who know their stuff, but that doesn't connect with any. On the sociological level, there is an unbridgeable chasm between us and them. And that is why we sound unconvincing when we are talking about our doctrines, pardon, their doctrines. Um, this doesn't mean that Adventists can never preach about doctrines to which they cannot connect, for example, sanctuary, just because we never experience the disappointment. The lack of experience does not necessarily preclude someone from speaking with authority on the topic. There is an incident in Paul's life where it was it is evident from from the text that he actually lacked personal experience of freedom in some areas of his life but that did not preclude him from from uh teaching uh and it's written in second corinthians 12 7 to 9 uh, he says unless i should be exalted above uh, measure by the abundance of the revelations a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than the, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What does this mean? This means that personal weakness can become the major source of our authority only if we, but we have to be honest about ourselves. We have to be honest about where we are when we speak about certain topic. Speaking with the authority means speaking truth, not just spitting correct data, spitting out facts. We can talk as seekers rather than authorities on the topic. That's something that gives authority. We can approach the topic of sanctuary with humility, and openness since, since we have zero experience with its rea reality. And that's what actually gives us authority because people would, will recognize that we are basically almost on the same level as them. And here lies the, here line, herein lies, lies the cost. The cost is our false image, our false image of authorities on the second coming, on, on whatever we, we like to boast, uh, you know, to be special. Uh, as, 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 as people and our message. Uh, the word of God is like kryptonite, you know, for Superman. It breaks us and makes us in one stroke of revealed truth. To me, this makes perfect sense. Personal suffering of a sinner that offers a journey rather than certainty and demonstrates joy and peace in the face of the uncertainty of that journey are often the, the best proof that our words are more than just mere talk, that we are not selling something, that we, but that we are seeking something. 
that we ask other people to join us in that search. The greatest testimonies that nobody forget are the result of a clash between a witness that does not deny his or her weakness and the word of God that cuts through this, <laughs> through this witness and turns his or her soul inside out in front of the audience. The courage and sincerity in the encounter with the word um, that simultaneously leads to the loss of everything and gain of everything. Loss means death of false self and gain, which means the new birth of new identity of a sinner, but in Christ. That is what gives authority uh, to, to, to people who, who preach more than anything else. If we be like this on our pulpits, the church would never again be boring and uninventful uneventful place. Expert knowledge does not give authority. Maybe it gives in academia, but that's just academia is an ivory tower of isolation. It's not a real place. I mean, it is real, but the real life doesn't apply there. Mere knowledge can be a snare as well. Paul had to deal with this kind of reality in his days. He said, I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And that, that comes as a shock to the people who claim for themselves to be the people of the book. Uh, according to this verse, if we are people of the book, we missed the point. We missed the point. We completely missed the target. One, we should be people of power. And one among manifestation of that power is authority, inner authority that Jesus earned. When he was born here, he was earning this authority throughout his life. And then share that authority for the, goods, for the good of others. If the authority does not come from the experience, personal experience of growth in this, in this way, in this, on this journey, or if the word does not, spoken word, uh, our testimony does not bear personal cost to us. We lost not only authority, but we lost ourselves to the empty talk. And that's, that can happen without us ever, ever noticing it. Um, to conclude with another great quote uh, of Kierkegaard, the greatest hazard of all, losing one's self, can occur very quietly in the world. And if it, as if it were nothing at all. No other loss can occur so quietly. Any other loss, an arm, a leg, five dollars, a wife, etc., is sure to be noticed. And I think that's what happened to us as, as a movement. As the years went by, as the distance from the extraordinary event of 1844 increased, with each decade we were quietly losing more and more of ourselves because the theology was less, less relevant for us, for our own experience. Like that proverbial frog that is slowly cooked to death without ever noticing it. Today we know everything about our beginnings, about the pioneers, about where we made the mistake, about you know, theology and whatnot, but all that knowledge does not make us, does not make us them. It does not, and does not transfer the experience, the actual experience of, of uh, 1844 to, to us. It doesn't transfer the identity they found in those doctrines. And it never will. We are us, but we abandoned ourselves by chasing ghosts. And uh, that's how we became boring and lifeless and without a message to this world and we are trying to connect through you know with i don't know I, i've noticed many uh, leftist agendas uh, or rightist agendas whichever agendas but not our agenda and uh, that's so sad uh, so i will stop here uh, and i would love to talk a little bit with you guys uh, and um, see if we can uh, go deeper into maybe solutions or whatever. Thank you.